To me, the greatest drivers are those that you could kind of stick in anything, whether it was a NASCAR or an IndyCar, Formula, and, and they just figured it out. Welcome to Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour, presented by NASCAR on Fox. And today we have a guest that we've been asking for for a while now, McLaren uh, Racing CEO, Zach Brown, who has basically taken the McLaren F1 program and put it back on the map. And, and what a powerhouse program they have built, whether it's an F1 or IndyCar, um, all around the world in, in different divisions of racing. And, and obviously for, for us in the NASCAR world, um, kind of hits home because of the fact that, that Kyle Larson also ran their IndyCar at the Indy 500. And we'll do that again next year. So we've got a lot of questions uh, that hopefully Zach will be uh, willing to answer and, and have fun with. So hope you enjoy this interview with Zach Brown. Well, Zach, thank you for, for taking the time today. We've, um, we've obviously been in the middle of this this huge storm here with with Kyle Larson and kind of going to IndyCar and all the all the questions that we have, but we don't want to start there. I, I want to start with your with your weekend because you guys won the F1 race, leading the IndyCar race until six or seven laps to go at the end. Tell me about your weekend because uh, from a McLaren standpoint, you've got to be pretty thrilled with the way that the weekend shook out. Yeah, it was uh, pretty uh, pretty awesome. I have now missed both of Oscar's wins because I've been in IndyCar races. So he continues to tell me to go to IndyCar races. Lando tells me to come back to F1 because Oscar wins every time I'm not around. And then every time I'm in an IndyCar race, we finish second. So I'm not sure where I should be, but uh, I love my racing. And I was in Nashville at the weekend. The uh, uh, race Oscar drove was uh, insane uh, to, to have Leclerc in his DRS for 32 laps, never a half a second off to not make a mistake was impressive. Uh, Lando going from uh, 17th, obviously started 15th by the time there was a few penalties was amazing. And then uh, Alex led for a bit. And then I thought Pato might be able to hold on there, but heard it was coming too fast. So not a bad weekend, a, uh, a first and a second. I'm still waiting for our uh, weekend. I'm getting greedy now of uh, winning on both sides of the pond. So we've been close. So you, on the F1 side, you, you, you have the Manufacturers Championship, obviously, uh, right in the middle of that with, with everything that you have going on uh, with, the, with the Manufacturers Points lead. And you look at the driver's points are a little bit, little bit further apart. And I think for, for, for us on the, on the NASCAR side, how does, how does that work from an F1 team standpoint? Obviously, you want to win the Manufacturers Championship, but if you win the Manufacturers Championship and you don't win the Driver's Championship, is that good, bad, or how is how that looked at from, from your world? Yeah, it's interesting because obviously I've grown up in racing, and I think as a fan, we all pay attention to the, the Drivers' Championship, right? I think that's the one that's the most popular amongst uh, racing fans. And when you get into NASCAR and IndyCar, you don't have, um, you, you know, these, I mean, I guess you do have team championships, and, and that's actually in Formula One where the, the money payout comes comes from, but you've got different cars, different quantity of cars, where in Formula One, it's real clean, right? Everyone runs two cars, there's 10 teams. So uh, it's interesting growing up around racing, it was all about the drivers, but then once you're in the team, you know, they're kind of both equally as important. Economically, the Constructors Championship is more important because that's what kind of pays out, but none of us go racing for for money. We go racing because we want to go racing. And uh, so both are critically important. I'm sure to the driver, the drivers is more important to the team. You know, I kind of now come into these race weekends. And when I'm thinking about the racing, I'm thinking about beating Ferrari, I'm thinking about beating Red Bull It's kind of my mindset. Those are the points that I'm kind of tallying in my mind on pit wall. Kind of secondary is, is, the driver, but I'm sure the driver's thinking the, uh, the other way around. So they're, they're, they're both, of course, equally as important. We're trying to do uh, both because they do go hand in hand. The more points Lando and Oscar get in the drivers, the better off we're going to do in the constructors. And, uh, you know, we're now leading the constructors the first time in a decade. And Lando's got, you know, some work ahead of them. And Oscar's not that far behind. Just Max is so good that uh, while we can – there's more points in play in the constructors. We're going to need a little bit of some good luck and Max to have a little bit of bad luck to close the gap that's currently sitting there. 
Well, it's been fun to watch. We're, we're obviously fans of, of F1 racing and continue to watch on a weekly basis. But the ground that you guys have made up um, has, has been uh, very intriguing and, and fun to watch. And, and as you go through the weekend, uh, the end of the IndyCar season, and for us at Fox, that means that we're headed towards uh, IndyCar season next year. And, and I think as you, as you look at F1 having more of a presence in, in the United States, and you compare that to IndyCar, how does F1 help hurt IndyCar racing in general? Does it just give it more notoriety just because people are looking at open wheel racing? Because I, I find that, um, you know, ever, ever since F1 has kind of taken a step back into America, I just want to see from somebody's standpoint, does that, how much does that help IndyCar? I think it helps a, a ton. You know, I, I think people that are racing fans, love IndyCar, Formula One, NASCAR, et cetera. I don't think it's an either or. No different than in stick and ball sports, right? You Football might be your favorite sport, you, but you probably also like basketball and baseball. So generally, I think it's great for IndyCar because it just brings more awareness to uh, open wheel uh, racing. I think it's exciting that IndyCar is going to be on uh, Fox next year. I think that's the big shot in the arm, all on network, longer programming. And then, of course, the, the big boss, Eric Shanks, is passionate about IndyCar. So I'm excited about the new uh, TV package. I think we at IndyCar, if I put my IndyCar hat on, can be doing a better job of uh, drafting the success that Formula One's had in North America. I, I, you know, we put Pato Award in our, in our car. I think we should talk about that more because I think IndyCar racing as a product is awesome. So we should be, there's so many new fans that Formula One's created that I think we need to be tapping into those fans and saying, hey, if you like Formula One, come check out IndyCar. And then I think you'll have people that love both. I don't think they'll tune out of F1 and become IndyCar fans or IndyCar fans tune out and become, I think you like both of them. They're two similar type of racing, but also different in different time zones. So uh, I, I think the awareness that Formula One's created in North America is good for all motorsports, and I think we can do a better job of embracing it. Well, I think it, it's obviously, America is obviously important to what you guys do. You've got an extensive background on, on the sponsorship side from uh, your agency and things that, 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 and also the things that you guys do with sponsorship on your F1 cars and Indy cars and, and everything that, that you're so good at. How important is it to have an American driver in F1? And do we need more American drivers in, in IndyCar? Where do you see that balance? Yeah, I think um, I think it would help for sure. Uh, you know, I don't think we necessarily uh, kind of need them in the sense of you know Formula One is now uh, huge in, in America w without a uh, U.S. driver. Um, but sorry, I got my door ringing. Um, and, but I think it would be very additive. But I think what's important is it needs to be a successful and ideally a, a, a famous uh, American driver. So you know, if I look back, had Michael Andretti. Um, kind of made it, if you like. I think that would have been wonderful in Formula One. I think if it's an American driver that's maybe lived in Europe his whole life, I think it's a little bit harder because they lack that U.S. knowledge. I mean, can you imagine someone like Kyle Larson coming over and doing F1? And I don't think that's you know realistic because the disciplines are so different where he's kind of grown up racing, but that would be massive. And I think anytime we see these uh, sports where you get, you know, there's a lot of uh, nationalistic uh, um, excitement around that. So I think it would be additive for sure, but I don't think it's necessary. Where do you think, where do you think, so I'm just going to, uh, I'll explain uh, Keelan's situation. My son, we, we went to Europe and, and raced over in the cart system for a year and a half. And, and I look at a kid like Connor Zilich. Connor Zilich is, is someone that I view could have made it, you know, up the path of F1 through F4, F3, F2. The problem that I that I see with, well, not only is it expensive, and and I couldn't take the time to to send Keelan over there to to race for the for the next seven or eight years uh, on his own without without being there with him. But when you look at it, let's just use Zilich as an example. Um, you know, he was in and won in the European karting system. H how do we make our F4, F3 system here? the open wheel system more competitive for these kids to have a shot to be able to say, 
hey, Zach Brown's calling me uh, because I've won F4, F3 in America to get that development system where it needs to be to be recognized for a kid like Connor Zilich to be able to, to get into that system, to be really recognized without having to spend, like Logan Sargent did uh, over in Europe, so many years of, in that karting system over there. Yeah, I, I think um, coming up through, through IndyCar, right, you had a lot of success, the, the Villeneuve, uh, because Zanardi was Formula One when IndyCar went went back, uh, but Villeneuve was massively uh, successful. I think Michael, unfortunately, was the right place at the wrong time. One of the challenges now, uh, which is unfortunate, is we have so many testing restrictions in Formula One. We we only do three preseason test days, so the the risk of taking a driver who hasn't raced at all the European circuits or the you know the the global circuits is hard back when Villeneuve came over he did 20,000 miles of testing so you you could take a driver that you knew had immense talent but and obviously Villeneuve was Canadian but uh, you know come came from uh, US racing um, but you could you know pound around and go test at all these tracks and you you can't now so the the situation's a bit trickier the other thing that you have and i don't know how much of this happens in the states but it happens all the time in europe which uh, I, I don't like i'm not a fan of these kids are uh leaving school and being homeschooled from seven eight years old and living at cart tracks and I, i've been an advocate um, but I, I don't think i'll be successful of Kids should be in school during the school year and carting at the weekends or after they're done with school. And then, of course, you've got summer off. And so now what's happened is with these kids that eight years old are living at cart tracks five days a week, getting homeschooled. It's raising the bar of the talent and um, they're unbelievable talent. But, you know, for every, as you know, 10,000 kids that want to be the next Lando Norris or Oscar Piastri, most of them don't make it. Then you got these kids that kind of were brought up at cart tracks and weren't socialized in school. And so that's made the bar um, really high. And I think you have a little bit less of that uh, in, in the state. So I think we got a little bit of imbalance of how much in the junior formulas kids are living at racetracks versus the, the states. And then you have these testing restrictions, which means it's higher risk taking someone who hasn't kind of lived in Europe taking them cross border across the pond like we used to be able to do in the good old days when you look at the at the development system in in general um you know the 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 it's pretty straightforward for for f1 through through the karting system and i look at a kid like kyle larson that has come through uh, everything that, that you can possibly drive on on dirt transferred over to to asphalt immediately had success you got to be around Kyle, uh, uh, obviously a lot with with the IndyCar program uh, at, at the Indy 500. You've seen what what Kyle can do, and and just he's fast, right? Like he's brave, he's fast, he he's he picks things up really quickly. He's creative, and I think being creative, uh, we saw that at, at Indy this year with a lot of the things that he did in the IndyCar in the Cup race when he was able to manu- maneuver through traffic. When you see a guy like like Kyle Larson, and you see that talent, and you and you think to yourself, okay. Kyle went and did dirt and he wound up with this. Sometimes you, you just wonder, is it just that, that natural gift that, that you're talking about that, that some of these guys have? But what, did, what, what was the thing about Kyle Larson that, that stuck out to you when he got in that Indy car that you were really surprised with or not surprised with um, you know, from his time that you got to spend around him? He, uh, he's as naturally talented as any racing driver I've I've ever seen. I think, uh, and I saw this a lot out of Fernando when I brought him, Alonzo, to uh, the Indy 500. So you, you see the, the kind of championship qualities of, of these guys. He was very calm. Nothing seemed to be happening too fast for him. And they're able to compartmentalize. So, you know, both Kyle and Fernando, they knew where they needed to be on race day, but then they took it one day at a time you know they were never too hung up on the the time sheets or they never got ahead of themselves and that's where you get yourself in trouble you know and that's kind of that's some experience versus you know maybe some um you know antonelli who's going to be a great talent at mercedes he went out and his first free practice one while he was unbelievably quick he also crashed quickly and he was you know that i think that was 
not lack of talent. That was lack of experience. So you see someone like Kyle and Fernando, they've got an extreme amount of confidence in themselves. They, they study a lot. They ask a lots of questions and they creep up on it knowing, Hey, I got 10 test days before I have to be on top of this. So they don't, they, they kind of use each session one at a time. They know exactly what they're trying to achieve. They experiment. And Kyle was just in total control the entire month of May, never put a foot wrong, was unbelievably quick, qualified fifth. And actually, you know, we finished second and fourth. He was running in front of Pato and Alex, uh, you, you know, all, all race. And then unfortunately had a pit lane speeding uh, violation, which we had a bit of a long brake pedal, so I can't even say that was Kyle's fault. You know, I, I think he didn't have the, the, the brake pedal under him that he thought he would have because you get pad knock off around Indy. So, I mean, Kyle, you know, as a driver, he's as good as anyone I've ever seen. I think if you give him enough time in a Formula One car, he'd be competitive. The problem is coming back to those testing restrictions and the time, there isn't enough time that you could give him to learn all these circuits and with how competitive Formula One is, you only have to be off by a tenth to be the difference between pole and, and you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth right now, or to be from eighth to, to 15th. But, you know, Kyle is a racing driver. That guy's awesome. So is there ever a scenario that you think we could maybe get one of those older McLaren F1 cars and, and do the old driver swap at one of these racetracks where we could we could see, I think everybody in, in a, a American racing fan wants to see Kyle Larson just do it one time as far as, make laps and drive. Is that, is that something that, you know, we think we could put together? Yeah, we've been uh, chatting about it. Kyle, as you can imagine, definitely wants to do it in between our schedule, which goes from February to December and NASCAR schedule, which I think is, you know, what, February to November, finding that window. We did that with uh, Jimmy Johnson and uh, Fernando in Bahrain uh, with, with Hendrick Motorsport. Uh, that must have been about uh, four or five years ago, and that was a lot of fun. So I'd love to see Kyle in an F1 car. It is something that we've discussed and something that I think will happen down the uh, down the road. So how did this all start? Kyle Larson, I, you know, I think I, I think we're we're all a little we're all really intrigued because I love when the drivers go to the 24 hours of Daytona. I love when they go back and forth from NASCAR um, to IndyCar. I love when the F1 guys seeing Juan Pablo Montoya in the car this weekend in a NASCAR race again. I, I just think that that crossover really makes the, well, it's, it's really fuels the, the conversation that we have now because so few of, of these guys cross over back and forth. You, you know, we've seen Alonzo do it. We've seen Kyle Larson do it. Um, but, you know, I think w when you look at that, would you like to see more of these guys kind of come together at the 24 hours of Daytona? Because for, for me, I, I always looked at the 24 hours of Daytona was where the world's racing drivers met. And they created these relationships. They had these conversations of, you know, he's great, he's good, but he's a good person. And it was this, this free advertisement that we all got around the world about how great each division's drivers were. Is that something that you see as important as we go forward? Definitely. I, and I love it. Right. I mean, that's the Mario Andretti, the Dan Gurney, the AJ Foyt, Jackie Stewart, uh, the Graham Hills, you know, Jimmy Clark. The, these guys raced every weekend in different types of, of cars, whether it was dirt, Formula One, Le Mans, Daytona. Uh, and I think it's really cool. And I think that's where you see the best drivers. Right. You can get unbelievable drivers that are great in their discipline but maybe have a bit more of a challenge to to cross over so to me the greatest drivers are those that you could kind of stick in anything whether it was a nascar or an indycar or Formula, and, and they just figured it out and now you have uh you know such a big sport you get into sponsor conflicts you get into manufacturer conflicts right if we were running a a Honda, then it, in IndyCar, then that wouldn't have made it possible for Kyle. But fortunately, we both share a great relationship with Chevrolet. You know, there's no sponsor conflict. So, uh, you know, we have to be respectful and understanding of that. But the, I, I'm a fan of, yeah, bringing Fernando over, bringing Kyle over. Uh, you know, Dale Jr. asked me even about would McLaren consider NASCAR. And it's, it, you know, it isn't something that we would do. It's such a big commitment. And I've got so much respect for all these different series. I think people are fools to underestimate, 
how difficult these uh, championships are, right? You know, the, the Formula One drivers come over to NASCAR, not so easy. Um, and so, uh, but it did get me thinking, doing something around the Daytona 500, uh, kind of like we're doing with Henrik Motorsport around the Indy 500, that'd be kind of kind of cool seeing a papaya uh, NASCAR going around Daytona. So it's got me thinking, um, and, and I do think it's really cool to see these crossover, and I think that's coming back to what we started with, you know, is Formula One or these series are way competitive or complementary. I think it's I put it all in the bucket of it's racing and, and anything that's good for racing is kind of good for all of us. Well, you know, regardless of the actual discipline it takes place in, it's just racing. So which one of your guys would be the most likely to to on the F1 side to, to say, hey, I want to go run the Daytona 500 in that car? Uh, Oscar seems to be uh, I mean, they both love to drive everything but uh oscar's kind of knocked on my door a little bit about uh uh his his uh excitement around nascar so i think if we were to do something with kyle and one of our formula one drivers it'd probably most likely be oscar well i want to talk about you and you know i think for for us we were talking a little bit about um our backgrounds but before we before we we came on the air um so you have a karting background, and little did I know that we karted in, in a lot of the same circles out west in, in California. So tell me how you got started and just with, with karting and, and just specifically where you started uh, out west. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I miss karting. That, that was kind of my uh, uh, favorite memories. It was interesting when Senna was asked what was his... Uh, favorite memories in, in racing. And he went all the way back to, to karting because it was so pure and it's what kind of got us started. So I'm originally from Southern California, the uh, Valley boy. And um, uh, kind of a strange uh, way to get into racing. I, I My first ever race was the 1981 Long Beach Grand Prix. I went to with my, uh, with my family, just, you know, kind of mom and dad took us there because the race was in town and I was 10 years old. And just made a huge impression on me. I remember the grandstand we were in. It was a Williams one, two. So I fell in love with racing. Then I used to then go to Riverside international raceway for the, uh, Winston, I think it was called the Winston Western 500 and the Warner Hodgson 400. Yeah. So, uh, watching Bobby Allison and Daryl Waltrip and Richard Petty, you know, the famous last corner, you know, that real long right hander, the IMS races. Then I would go to the drag races in Pomona with Tony Nancy and, uh, uh Don Perdome and John force, uh, were racing. So I just loved racing. Then I went on Wheel of Fortune Team Week that had nothing to do with uh, racing and, and won at 13, got some, uh, won some watches that as a 13-year-old, as much as I think Cartier watches are great, at 13, it's like, what are you going to do with Cartier watch? Went back to the Long Beach Grand Prix in 87 with a buddy in high school whose family was into racing, met Mario Andretti, uh, was very intimidated and just asked him, how do you get started in racing? He said, karting. And there happened to be an ad in there for Jim Hall Kart Racing School, which was out at, uh, you know, Oxnard. So my parents didn't want me to do it. And I went and sold the watches at a, a pawn shop in Van Nuys and then paid to go to the kart racing school, then went to the advanced course, then went to the racing school at the racing school, had success, um, and then went and bought a go kart from Pitts Performance, uh, who was uh, also in the Valley. Uh, never was a big fan of, uh, school. So kind of decided let's try this racing stuff. So instead of being at school, I'd be at a cart racing shop and, uh, just started racing all the time. And, and, uh, it was kind of lived it, breathed it, would stick the cart in the back of my Volkswagen Jetta. I'd have to take the wheels off and move the axle around to kind of wedge it, uh, uh, in, <laughs> in the, uh, in the trunk or the boot, as we call it in, uh, in England now and lived it, you know, Bakersfield, you know, Rick Mears' son, Clint Mears. I remember remember uh, you and Richie Hearn and Buddy Rice, who went on to win the Indy 500. And uh, uh, really cool stuff. Scott Pruitt and Ron Emick were kind of the legends of uh, Southern Cal. They were out of uh, karting by then, but on to, to bigger things, especially Scott Pruitt. And so uh, what was cool is at um, uh, uh, Monterey Historics this year, the Adams family uh, came up to me and they had no idea, you know, kind of where I was from and their son uh, races and they wanted to introduce them. And they're like, yeah, we're from uh, Riverside. I'm like, Adams cart track, like the cart track. 
they were blown away. They had no idea. I know it's like I've raced her a thousand times. It's a, that was one of the best kart tracks. So that was uh, really cool. So I enjoy uh, reminiscing about the uh, the karting days. And then from there, went to uh, uh, Europe to go race. And that's how I got into the sponsorship business. I didn't have any family resources, so I had to learn how to do sponsorship. And then uh, raced professionally for 10 years, started my uh, motorsports agency, sold that after 20 years, and then got a awesome opportunity to either go to Formula One or McLaren and chose McLaren because I wanted to be uh, not only in the commercial side of the sport, which I love, but I wanted to be in the race. And so uh, chose McLaren and it's been uh, now in my eighth season and absolutely loving it. Yeah, it's been it's been a remarkable turnaround to to see every everything that that you guys have been able to accomplish with with McLaren. As you look at the karting system and how how does McLaren how do you guys scout talent? Do you have a team, a karting team? What what is the process for you guys to scout talent because you have so many rides to to fill and and so many seats to keep after who's the hot prospect and, and where is the, the, where is that Avenue for, for McLaren and and how you guys go about finding talent? Yeah, we have a a driver development uh, team. It's about a half a dozen uh, people. We have drivers, everything from uh, uh, formula two, you know, which is one step away from formula one. We, we uh, look after Gabriel who's actually leading the formula two championship. We then have a couple drivers in formula three, couple drivers in formula four uh and then in karting so we're trying to kind of make sure that you know we can't quite predict when we might have a gap in our formula one seed or indycar seed or formula e so we we kind of have a half a dozen drivers that are always under contract that are at various stages of their career that we're uh helping financially uh helping of course technically uh mental performance that um, we hope to be able to deploy. We've got reserve drivers or or a lot of simulation. So we have a lot of uh, seats to to fill. And then, of course, while you have your driver development, we're always kind of paying attention to the the marketplace and, you know, where there might be a gap. So Oscar, we we found actually out of a competitor's uh, driver development uh, program, they weren't quite ready to move on him. And we were and knew he was a massive talent. And then, of course, uh, while you're always trying to find your own talent, you're sometimes signing people from other teams like we did with Christian Lungard. Um, but, you know, I much prefer to kind of bring talent up through the ranks because then you build a long term relationship uh, with them. We had some driver drama, of course, in IndyCar here the last uh, 18 months, which is now uh, settled. But, you know, you've got to have the best drivers in the business in any discipline you're in because the competition is so good you got to have the best driver lineup is, is a very important ingredient in success and winning races. So you, you've been through the boom. You, you sold sponsorship during the, the time of NASCAR being in this just out of control growth. Um, prices were, were, were through the roof. Now we've kind of gone through this transition where that's all stabilized and, and, and kind of found its, its ground here. But I think that the the development landscape of, of drivers in today's world, the, the most common question that is asked now is about money and how, how much money can you bring. From a team standpoint, how do you balance the, the financial side of, of the driver and the talent side of the driver? Because it's, it's almost, it's kind of flopped, right? Like the guy that can bring yeah. the most money gets, gets the best ride. What, how do you think, where do you think that is? And how do you think we can make that better for the kids that are talented, but just don't have the dollars? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a unique part of our sport, um, which is not a great part of the, the sport, right? If you're great at baseball, um, you're going to make the MLB because you're great at baseball. You don't need equipment around you. You don't need resources. You know, you need a glove and a bat. And if you're great, you're going to make the team in racing. I can't imagine how many world champions are out there. NASCAR champions that are out there that never got the chance. will never get the chance because they didn't have the equipment under them or the resources, you know, from our standpoint, the healthier the sport can be to where teams can find sponsorship on their own. So they can hire drivers, which is where we are, uh, but not everyone is purely based on talent would be the healthiest situation. Unfortunately, some teams are really good at finding sponsorship. Some aren't. Some can find some sponsorship, so they need some subsidy. So 
an ideal scenario would be all these teams have enough sponsorship that they can just go get Kevin Harvick because he's the best racing driver available today. You know, not every team's in that situation. So it's like, well, we'd rather have Kevin, but he doesn't have a dollar. But Bob over here is, you know, pretty good, but he's got some money. And and that's, you know, that's unfortunate. Fortunately, the Hendrick Motorsport, the McLarens, uh, Richard Childress uh, of the world um, usually have the resources that they don't need to find that balance. But that's not the case with all forms of motor racing. So we all just need to be really good at finding sponsorship because someone's got to pay for it, whether you come from family resources, friend or a a sponsor, but it's the tricky part uh, of, of the business because racing's very expensive more so than other sports. And so someone's got to be writing the check. So who's the best one we don't know about from a driver's perspective right now? That's a, uh, that's a good question. I've, uh, I've seen a lot of talent over the years back when I was racing of, of drivers that were, uh, were, were pretty awesome that didn't get there. I do think the best of the best of the best do get there because people will figure out a way to do it. But for sure, there's been some that have uh, uh, slipped through the cracks. And then there's been some that have been amazing pedigrees that uh, for whatever reason, didn't quite get uh, to be the best, the wrong place, wrong time. You know, someone like Jan Magnussen, unbelievable driver dominated formula three everything says should have been a formula one world champion but he got in the mclaren and the mclaren wasn't that competitive at the time and then he was in jackie stewart's team which was a great team but not a a big team but like someone like john magnuson i think you know could have been tommy Byrne, who i'm sure you're uh, uh, aware of um you know massive talent you know he, he might have had his mouth got a little bit in the way uh from from time to time um but yeah you know and then drivers and carts that were amazing but you, you know you got to have the great equipment underneath you as well so i got two more questions and and based upon everything that, that we've talked about i i have to imagine I think that um, we've had a, a couple of pretty good stories, but what was your first car? What did you? What was the first car that you drove on the street? And then I'll, I'll, I want to know what that was, and then I want to know a car that you want to own. So uh, it was a Volkswagen Jetta, sixteen valve diesel. It was my dad's car, so he passed it down to me. That was my uh, first car, and the car I always wanted then because it was always a little bit sportier was the Volkswagen Scirocco. Um, so that was kind of growing up and a Mazda RX seven. I always thought the the rotaries were, uh, pretty cool. And, uh, today, uh, I'd love to have a, a Mercedes Goldwing. I'm a car collector. So, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get one, one of these days, but I always thought those were very, uh, iconic, but I, I much prefer racing cars. So I've got a racing car, uh, collection. That's quite eclectic of NASCARs, the Indy cars, the formula one cars, the group C cars, uh, cause I'm such a fan of the sport. I've gone from collecting the 124th to I got a little bit more cash. So I moved up to the 118th. And then fortunately when I sold my business was able to get some, uh, full scale models that I can, uh, drive. So I, I, I love racing. I consider myself to be a massive fan of the sport and the, the historic stuff kind of brings back my, my youth. So I really enjoy historic racing and I, I get more goosebumps when I meet, you know, Emerson Fittipaldi than I do, you know, today's racing driver. Cause you know, now I'm in the business growing up. It was like, Oh my God, that's Emerson Fittipaldi or Danny Sullivan or Rick Mears. And so, uh, I, I enjoy meeting the guys that I grew up racing who are the ones that kind of got me involved in the sport, the Mario Andretti's, these guys are, are legends. And I know we're racing today with the, the current legends. You're a legend of, of your sport. Um, and I, I think it's cool. I, I, I love it. Well, Zach, we don't have, we don't have many bigger race fans on this show than you. And you've been, uh, you know, a great part of the, the racing landscape, um, on really all, all sides of, of the racing world. And, and I appreciate the fact that uh, you took the time today to, to come talk racing with us because we, we love talking racing and, and we wish you nothing but the best uh, in all the different racing divisions. And we also look forward to, to having IndyCar on, on Fox next year. So thanks for taking the time today. It's going to be awesome. Great to uh, be on. Thanks for having me. 
We want to thank Zach for taking the time to uh, talk to us today. Hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. Um, we encourage you to follow us on YouTube or anywhere else on social media. We'll see you next week.